This podcast contains sensitive topics and discussions. Listener discretion is advised. A teenage girl turns up in Vancouver, Washington with no identification, telling police of a seemingly horrific past. But is there something more to the story? This is the Treva Throneberry story. Good. Today's case was suggested by one of our listeners, Stella L, in our Suggest a Case section. And she said that she thought we could really dig into the theory part of this case because there are quite a few and they're very interesting. And Stella, you are right. I'm excited to delve into this one. I believe Amy is going to be as well. I've never heard of this case. And neither had I. And that's what makes it also very appealing. Before I begin, though, I just want to do a last minute reminder for anyone who still might be interested in CrimeCon. We'll be there in Orlando, September 21st to the 24th. This is our first CrimeCon in person where we'll actually be on podcast row. And if you haven't purchased your tickets yet, you can go online and purchase them using the promo code WOMEN for 10% off. So we're both pretty excited to connect with people. If you're around or attending, please come say hello. After CrimeCon, though, we have a busy semester to return to, as usual. Yep. We're looking forward to enjoying ourselves there because after that, it's going to be a big push for us. Right, Amy? It always is. Yes. All righty then. Let's get back to today's story and meet Treva Throneberry. Treva was born in Wichita Falls, Texas in May of 1969 to parents Patsy and Carl. She was the youngest child of four sisters, and when she was still quite little, the family moved to the smaller town of Electra, Texas. Though Treva's parents appeared to work hard and love their daughters, Treva and her sisters experienced serious trauma at the hands of their uncle, Ray. Ray was Carl's brother who'd recently returned from Vietnam, and he lived locally as well. From the outside, he looked like an attentive uncle who simply liked to visit with his nieces frequently and spend time with his family. But all four of the sisters later reported that their uncle sexually assaulted them on a regular basis. And nobody said anything. They didn't say anything until years later. That's or correct. They were. OK. Nobody said anything. Uncle Ray abused alcohol and was very scary to the girls, just so you know. So they were afraid of him. They were afraid of the retaliation and what might happen if they turned him in or reported this. Unfortunately for Treva, Amy, she was the youngest. So her older sisters all married quite young and were able to leave the home. And I believe that's part of the reason some of them married so young is because they wanted to get out of the home. Mm -hmm. But this left Treva on her own and the sole remaining target during her uncle's visits. But when Treva turned 16, she decided she couldn't take the assault anymore. So in 1985, Treva went to her local police station and reported that her father had raped her at gunpoint. A very serious and shocking allegation. Was this the first we hear that her father was abusive as well? That is correct. And her parents adamantly denied these allegations. Even so, Treva was removed from the home because of the fear that she expressed and because of concern that they didn't want to place her back in a dangerous situation. And she was placed with the Gentry Foster family. She enrolled in a new high school and seemed to thrive academically. But Treva told people at school that she had been kidnapped and tortured by Satan worshipers. And she shared that she experienced suicidal thoughts. To make sure she was not a harm to herself, Treva was admitted to the Wichita Falls State Hospital for treatment, where she remained for several months. Once she was deemed ready to leave the household at age 17, Trina went to the Lena Pope Home for Girls in Fort Worth, Texas, where she remained until she turned 18 years old and graduated high school. At that point, Treva was no longer a juvenile, and so she was left to fend for herself. And on her own, with not a lot of options, Treva decided to return home to Electra, Texas. Upon her return, Treva refused to see her parents, opting to only visit with her sisters. Why was the relationship with her mother strained? Her parents both adamantly denied that anything had happened to her, and so she had 
pretty much cut off contact with them, but she did remain Both of them. Okay. in contact with her sisters. But even then, after just a few days of staying with her sisters, Treva left. Her sisters later reported that they knew the abuse had been terrible for Treva, especially after they'd all married and left the house. And one sister even said she really regretted that she hadn't done anything. She wished she had done something to help Treva get out of the situation or at least get through the trauma of sexual abuse. But while they seemed to know what happened, they didn't know where she'd gone. Treva did contact her foster mother, Sharon Gentry, a few times after her disappearance. And through that contact, we know that Treva was working as a cleaner at a motel for a little while. At other times, Treva was homeless or was able to take on menial jobs. But Sharon Gentry stopped getting calls from Treva after a few months, and she never heard from her again. In fact, Amy, years went by, and neither the Gentry family nor the Throneberry family had any word on what happened to Treva. Did they ever report her missing, or since she was an adult at this point, they just let it be? They let it be. She was an adult, and remember, she had come home, and she had left of her own volition, and her foster family did hear from her. Mm -hmm. So it just appeared that she did not want to be contacted. Mm Mm-hmm. In 1993, there was a rumor that Treva might have been one of the victims at the Branch Davidian tragedy in Waco, Texas, the compound that was led by David Koresh, in which so many people perished. But dental records could not be matched to Treva, and it was eventually determined that she was not one of the people who perished in that tragedy. Why did people think that she was possibly part of that? I'm not sure why. I'm not sure if it was because it was local and there were young people who didn't have connections who joined this cult. Mm -hmm. It seemed like it was really just a rumor, but to rule it out because they didn't know where she was, Mm -hmm. you know, they looked at dental records, but they were also using dental records to identify all of the people. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't specifically for her. But by the mid 1990s, most people assumed that Treva was deceased and her parents even maintained burial insurance for their youngest daughter hoping one day someone would at least find her remains and they could bury her. Now, this is very uh, sad. Um, You know, can you imagine your parents maintaining burial insurance for you as a teenage girl? While Treva could not be located, in 1996, a teenage girl would emerge that would eventually lead to some mysterious questions. This teenage girl was Brianna Stewart. And similar to Treva, she had experienced some serious trauma in her childhood. Brianna began attending a local church in Vancouver, Washington, and as parishioners got to know her story, they learned that Brianna was a teenager on the run who'd left an abusive home and had been hitchhiking and living on the streets throughout Oregon and Washington for the last couple of years. A young couple at this church felt sorry for her, and they decided to take Brianna into their home and provide her with a new life. This couple enrolled her in Evergreen High School, And counselors did an interview with her to see where her placement should be. When asked about her childhood, Brianna said that she was originally from Oregon, but that her mother was murdered. And after living with her abusive stepfather for some time, she ran away and had come to Washington in search of her biological father. Now, though her background was of concern, the counselors gave Brianna a chance at school and she was placed in the 10th grade. Brianna did very well in English. And she studied the Bible and she liked to play tennis, though she was reportedly a terrible player. So it's funny. I read this in a couple of places that she was literally like the worst player on the team. She was happy to be playing. Oh, yeah. She seemed to be enjoying her new school, though she wasn't very popular. She wasn't very fashion forward or she didn't seem to care about that. She wore her brown hair in pigtails. She dressed in overalls and tennis shoes most days of school. So This wasn't exactly the style of the time, but she was happy and she was comfortable. In one of her classes, Algebra, Brianna made a new friend by the name of Ken Dunn. And Brianna's friendship with Ken quickly turned into something more. The two exchanged notes for a while, as high schoolers do. You remember that, right? I still have a lot of my high school notes. Do you really? Yeah, sometimes I'll look through them and take pictures and send them to my friends. It's fun. That's so funny. I have a couple. I have a couple in a box because I remember... I remember the whole thing, pass it up to so-and-so, pass it up, you know. Uh-huh. And then, yep. you know, when your teacher actually caught you with the note, oh, <gasps> goodness, the worst. Mortifying, okay. yes. Mortifying. <laughs> All right. But a common practice among teenage high school students. Ken and Brianna began spending time together after school at the food court and later attending church services together. 
Ken was reportedly smitten with Brianna, and although she was often closed-lipped about her past, one day when the pair was alone, Brianna finally divulged some terrifying secrets about her childhood. And Ken was really shocked by what he heard. According to Brianna, she witnessed her stepfather stab her mother to death. And while they lived together, she said that her stepfather and his friends repeatedly raped her and made videos of it. She also said that her stepfather had impregnated her before she'd even become a teenager and then pushed her down a flight of stairs, forcing her to miscarry. Wow. These are some serious, serious allegations. Absolutely. She said she had to flee from the home after her mother was killed because nobody would help her. Finally, Brianna said that she was also sexually assaulted by a security guard when she'd come to Vancouver. Now, Ken was obviously shocked by her awful past, but he loved her even more so for her honesty, and he hoped that he could help heal the tremendous hurt that she'd experienced. The pair attended the Sadie Hawkins dance together at the end of that year wearing matching overalls and exchanged I love yous. So this was a sweet 16-year-old high school romance. Until it wasn't, I'm assuming. Well, by this time, you know, things had really turned around for her by her junior year. The traumatized teenager seemed to be doing well in school, and she was starting to plan for her future. She wanted to go to law school. She wanted to study the law. The problem with her plan was that Brianna had no legal identification since she had run away from home without any documentation at the age of 13. But she desperately wanted to establish her identity so that she could get a driver's license, apply for jobs, and apply for college. So she began her quest to find her identification, and not without help. Social service workers and other government agencies tried to track down Brianna's real father and any birth records or other school records, health records, etc. Anything that could be traced back to Brianna, but they kept coming up empty-handed. Now, Brianna believed that she'd been born in Daphne, Alabama, and she actually returned there to work with law enforcement to try and identify places that she might remember. Mm -hmm. Though Brianna pointed to some places, some local places like McDonald's that she said she remembered visiting, the trip really didn't turn up any evidence that could establish her identity. So Brianna went back to Washington, and a few bizarre things came to light. First, and this is a little odd, Brianna told Ken that a dentist she recently visited kind of confronted her about her wisdom teeth having been removed and long healed, which was strange. Now, do you know why this would be strange? Because she was a little young to have her wisdom teeth out? Most people's wisdom teeth, I didn't really know this. I knew it was a little bit older, but most of them don't come in until between the ages of 17 to 25. Did you get yours out? I got mine out in my early 20s. I did too. It was on a college break. So this makes sense. It's Mm -hmm. fitting with the 20s or, you know, 19, Mm -hmm. 20 years old. I guess what was weird for Brianna to have had them come in, remove and heal by age 16 was out of the ordinary, let's say. Mm -hmm. And Ken thought this was odd, too. But Brianna was sort of defensive about it and annoyed about it. So Ken just let it go because it didn't seem like a big deal Mm -hmm. or something to argue about. But quite soon after that, Brianna moved out of the young parishioner's home that she had been staying with and began staying with the family of one of Ken's good friends. So Ken was good friends with this family, and Brianna was now staying with that family and the parents. According to Brianna, the reason she had moved out of the parishioner's home was because they really couldn't afford to keep her any longer. I think she might have felt even a burden. And so Ken's friend's family gladly took her in. But not long after living there, Brianna filed a report with the police against the father of Ken's friend, who Brianna said was making videotapes of her in secret while she bathed and undressed. Again, another very serious allegation. Another serious and shocking allegation. And so the police investigated because they took this very seriously, but they could not find one piece of evidence to substantiate her claims. But Brianna would have to find another new home. And her relationship with Ken became strained at this point. Though Ken loved Brianna, you know, young love, but reportedly loved her, the allegations with no evidence began to make him doubt things that she had shared about her past. And he was finding it very difficult to trust her and believe some of these things. I'm assuming he's the one who set Brianna up with this household. And if she's making these potentially false allegations, like I'm sure that didn't make him happy either. No, and it created friction. And also, I think that he just didn't believe that this was true. Understandably, too. 
So their relationship was pretty much coming to an end. They both graduated, but Brianna had not given up on her quest to claim her identity. Post-graduation, Brianna worked with Portland lawyers to try to establish her legal identity. So these lawyers submitted health and school records and other documentation to support Brianna's claims about who she was. And finally, in 2001, it seemed as if Brianna was going to get her wish and the state was going to award her with proper identification. Even though they didn't have a birth certificate or other early documentation. Correct. Well, Brianna was thrilled at this point. She'd been working for three years for this moment. And I believe, you know, she was about 19 years old at this time. But just as the good news came in, the Vancouver police showed up on Brianna's doorstep. And they were not there to help her this time. Rather, they had come to arrest Brianna. For what, you might ask, Amy? <laughs> well, I, I can guess for what, for identity theft. So two charges, one for fraud and the other for perjury. All right, what had Brianna done? As it turns out, in order to support her claims for her identity, Brianna had submitted fingerprints, which is standard protocol. But Brianna's fingerprints pinged a match. Mm -hmm. They were in the system. And Amy, can you guess whose fingerprints matched Brianna's? Let me guess they were Treva's fingerprints. So yes, 19-year-old Brianna's fingerprints matched the missing 31-year-old Treva Throneberry. Oh. oh my goodness. I didn't realize that the age difference. That's wild. Yes. That's why I kept giving dates about both of them, but that is wild. How could this be? Was she, was Brianna really a 31-year-old Treva posing as a high school student? I mean, that would explain the wisdom teeth. It would explain the wisdom teeth, but can you pose as a high school student at that age? I want to tell you if you're, you're going to look at photos. And Brianna had, you know, she wore the pigtails and kind of young clothes. Maybe now we can understand why, but she always looked a little older and a little more fuller figure than her peers. Uh -huh. She looked more adult-like, although most people believe that she was a child. So was this really her? And had she defrauded the foster care system and the other welfare agencies with all of her claims this whole time? Sounds like it. Shock ran through the community with Ken at the top of that list. And the story gained massive press attention. So much so that eventually Treva's sisters spoke up telling the media about the awful sexual abuse they had all experienced as children and explaining that's why they believed that Treva had created a new identity and tried to distance herself from her past. Now, you may be getting to this, but I'm assuming Ken and Brianna were intimate. Is this statutory rape as well? I don't know how intimate they were, but that is a great question. And I will get to that and address that later on. Okay. They shared a romance, mm -hmm. but I don't know how far that romance went. After this information was reported, you might be surprised to learn that there was a largely sympathetic response with most people advocating for mental health treatment for Treva. I think this was after her sister spoke out, all claiming or all reporting the sexual abuse mm -hmm. and explaining that Treva had been left behind to endure it on her own. Megan, who is Brianna? Is she a real person or is she a made up identity? Well, you'll have to find out. You'll have to wait to find okay. out. Okay, okay. But I will tell you this, Treva refused to be called Treva. She would only go by Brianna even after this information was exposed. She wouldn't even hear of the possibility that she was Treva Throneberry. She adamantly maintained her innocence and claimed she had no idea who this Treva was. In fact, Amy, get this, she demanded the police test her DNA against the Throneberry family. Hmm. That's pretty bold, wouldn't you say? Yeah. If you're lying, that's a pretty bold move. I'm starting to wonder if this is a serious mental health disorder whereby she truly believes she is not Treva. I think that's the great question here. But the law enforcement, I think they were thrilled to do the DNA. And guess what? It was a match. Yep. So on a literal molecular level, Brianna Stewart was really Treva Throneberry. But what would the Vancouver prosecuting attorney do with all this information? Well, prosecutor Michael Kinney said that Treva Throneberry was nothing but a con artist who had lived off the system for all of this time. But just so you know, he wasn't opposed to offering her a plea deal. Well, they never are. No, he offered Treva. I'm saying Treva because she was called that by him and by most people. 
a guilty plea for in exchange at first for two years in prison for her crimes. And she would have to admit on the record that she was, in fact, Treva Throneberry and not Brianna Stewart. Treva refused the deal, even though Kinney had lowered that prison sentence to just jail time. I read a couple accounts, but it looked like he might have even offered her something like four to six months. But upon learning that her attorneys were also going to argue that she was Treva, but believed she was Brianna, she decided to fire her attorneys as well. I, I was going to say that the part of the plea that she didn't like was the fact that she had to say that she was, in fact, Treva. And she's doubling down on that. Is she also saying that those people were not her siblings? Yes. She was saying, like, I don't know who they are. That's exactly what she was saying. Yes. She made a very foolish move, though, here. She fired her attorneys and decided to represent herself at trial. Mm. Well, okay. she'd been studying the law and felt she could prove her innocence better than anyone else. How is she trying to explain away the DNA? You you can't explain that away. She did. She said that cancer treatment, chemotherapy would alter people's blood and somehow alter their DNA. That was her explanation. She had chemotherapy? She did not, but she is saying that members of her family did. She explained it that way, I think, for one or two of her family members, but her explanation was simply that the DNA had been altered and they wanted it to match hers. Kind of like a setup here. Okay. The prosecution called witnesses to establish the reliability and the match of the fingerprints. Treva did very little to contradict the conclusion in her defense. But there were some other bombshells, just so you know. First, the prosecution called in Treva's foster mother, Sharon Gentry, from Texas. Now, this was an interesting exchange when it was Treva's turn to cross-examine her. Treva asked questions about the photos Sharon had brought. But instead of saying like, oh, that's me or, you know, they were discussing her. So it was a weird exchange. She would ask questions like, oh, what kind of person was this Treva? And Sharon answered as if the girl standing in front of her wasn't Treva, though she knew it was. You know, she was saying, well, I guess Treva was this kind of person. Question. Was there any sort of mental health evaluation to see if she was competent to defend herself? Yes, they de they deemed her competent. But that's a great question. The prosecution also presented evidence to establish that Treva used Brianna as an alias. Now, the prosecution brought in witnesses and records that showed Treva had used several aliases in other places during the years she disappeared. Here's where some of the bombshells come in. She went by the name Keely Smith in Oregon for quite some time, moving around and staying with different families. At one point, she'd petitioned to have her name legally changed to Keely Smith, telling police that she had fled her home and was running for her, her abusive stepfather. When police began to question this story, Keely disappeared, making her way to an Idaho town where she said her name was Kara Leanna Davis. She also told the story that she had fled from her sexually abusive father. Later that year, a teenager named Kara Williams arrived in Texas, where she went through several foster homes and high schools until such time when a social worker confronted her, asking if she was actually a 26-year-old missing woman named Treva Thromberry. I'm assuming she matched a picture that was circulating. Correct. Treva denied this, and even when confronted with those pictures, along with school records, and get this, a phone call from her father, Carl, who they had contacted, she denied she was Treva. Wow. She had a phone call with her father. And acted like yes. she didn't even know this person. She said, I'm very sorry for your loss of your daughter. I'm simply not her, and I don't know who she is. She switched identities many, many times, and in between sustained some arrests and short jail stints for providing a fraudulent identity and or filing false police reports. All of this happened, Amy, until she really found this permanent spot in Vancouver when she became Brianna Stewart, and that would be her permanent and last identity. When the case had concluded, the only evidence that Treva had submitted related to the time she spent as Brianna. So Brianna's school records, her health records, and everything during that small time period, you know, of a couple of years. But she hadn't presented any other evidence prior to that to establish who she was. I, I don't know what she was hoping. She was just hoping they would believe that she was Brianna. But the prosecution felt like it was a slam dunk case. Sounds like it. Yeah. 
I can tell you this. The jury quickly found Treva guilty and she was sentenced to three years in prison. The last thing Treva said publicly after being sentenced was that it was not fair and that she was simply being punished for being a teenager. So she wouldn't even admit that she was older, even though I'm assuming they were able to do tests to try to determine her biological age. The testing that they did was DNA and dentals. They didn't really need anything else. They established that, but she just would not admit that. And she still looked quite young, I will say, for her age. You know, it's funny. I thought about, um, I was like, how could she get away with this? And then I remembered watching, remember, did you watch Beverly Hills 90210? Of course. Do you remember some of the castmates like uh, Luke Perry and, oh gosh, there was someone else I can't remember. Some of them were about 29 or 30 years old, maybe 30, 31. Mm -hmm. Like some of them were very late 20s to early 30s. And they were able to pull off playing high school students. So there are some yeah. people who do look significantly younger. Mm-hmm. And I guess Treva maintained her innocence. She was released after serving two years in the Washington Correctional Center for Women. But she still adamantly maintained her innocence and even convinced the state of Washington, get this, or this is what I read, to provide her with an ID in the name of Brianna Stewart. And I'm assuming they will not do so? No, she convinced them. She apparently got an ID. You're saying she convinced? What kind of ID? Like a state issue? I guess it was a state issue. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. But after her release, this is the ID she wanted. This is the name she wanted. I mean, as an adult, you can legally change your name. So she just had to, in order to legally change her name, she had to admit that she was Treva. I don't know if that's the case and if that's what she did, <laughs> yeah. but she did get an ID and it was not in the name of Treva. Okay. She never acknowledged that she was Treva, Amy. And in the end, I suppose she didn't have to. Treva was in the news again in 2016. I couldn't find much on her in between that time. When she went to trial, I think it was like 2000, 2001. So for a good period... There was no information that I found. But in 2016, living under the name Brianna, she was in the news for accusing a man of sexually assaulting her at the hotel where she worked. Seems like a pattern. Yes, a very clear pattern. The claim was quickly dismissed and she was fired from that position. Not much else is known about Treva these days. I will tell you this. I did see the picture of her in the hotel. And even though it's somewhat years later, she looks significantly older than someone who would have been in her 30s. She definitely looks like someone, you know, more along the age of Treva in her possibly uh, late 40s to early 50s. Well, that's the thing. It's like when I was in my high 20s, low 30s, I could still pass for a teenager. But everything changes once you reach once you're around 40. It's all downhill from there. That's true. I always looked younger, too, until 40. And then no one no one <laughs> mistook me for much younger anymore. Nope, nope, nope. I need to know why pose as a teenager just so people would take her in because she needed the financial help. Obviously, if she was an adult, people wouldn't be so willing to help her. Yeah, this is a great question. So let's explore that. I mean, now that we know the story, the more interesting part here is why did she do this? Why did this happen? And again, this is what the reason Stella suggested this case. So I think there's a few possibilities. First of all, the one would be, as the prosecutor said, it's a straightforward one. Mm -hmm. Treva was simply a fraud who decided it was easier to live off the state and other people financially by posing as a teenager. And so this was a better option than trying to find her way as an adult with no resources. Mm hmm. That's one possibility. Another possibility, Treva couldn't handle growing up sort of like the Peter Pan yes. and Wendy syndrome. You've heard mm-hmm. of this. This is technically not a recognized diagnosis, yeah. but has been observed in certain people that they cannot handle growing up and they must sort of continue to live in a childlike state. I know you said she was evaluated for competency to you know, represent herself. Were there other mental health evaluations? Like I'm wondering... Is it possible that she suffers from dissociative disorder? Well, that is the other option. Mm -hmm. So if it's not that she's a fraud and it's not that she has the Wendy slash Peter Pan syndrome, is it possible that she was suffering from dissociative identity disorder, DID, otherwise referred to as multiple personality disorder? And this is where different personalities form to protect a person from the trauma they experienced in their original personality. This is a rare diagnosis, and in fact, it's one that some people dispute even exists. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a possibility, 
But oftentimes there are more personalities that develop to protect their host. Mm -hmm. But they also usually know their host personality. Mm -hmm. They can discuss that. In this case, there was no ability for Brianna to recognize that she was Treva. It also seemed that Brianna had developed different aliases, but they weren't quite distinct personalities. Mm -hmm. So that part isn't very fitting with disassociative identity disorder. She's claiming to know nothing about who Treva was, gotcha. which would not quite fit. And she settled on one identity in the end with no references to other personalities at all and no evidence of coexisting ones. So I don't think this is the right diagnosis either. All right. So I think that's a good point. So maybe that's not the correct diagnosis. Are there other mental health diagnoses that would possibly be relevant here? Okay, so there's another one that's closely related to DID that's called disassociative fugue. Mm. And this is a temporary state of amnesia in which a person can't remember who they are or where they came from. You said temporary. It is temporary. And that's the that's the problem here. So yeah. if this is in fact the case, then why could Treva never seem to recall well, where she came from? What does temporary actually mean? Maybe it's a 10 year right. temporary. Who knows? But it, that doesn't seem to fit that well either. Right. Another option is that Treva suffered from factitious disorder, mm -hmm. whereby, remember, she was telling a lot of stories about harm in order to gain attention and sympathy and other benefits from people. It's possible that she made up these stories about being a victim that didn't really happen to fit with factitious disorder or also for the purpose to gain attention, but to protect herself from really identifying the true abuse she actually suffered. These were kind of cover stories mm -hmm. that were safe for her. And this is a very confusing one for me. What do you think? I don't know. This is a tough one. At first, I thought DID, but your explanation makes me think otherwise. Factitious disorder, maybe a little more so. Part of me thinks she's intentionally sticking with the story because she wants to leave that horrible life behind, as anyone would. Yeah. And, you know, if what happened to her is, in fact, true, I can understand why she would just want to start all over. So part of me thinks that she knows very well that she's Treva, but she's just sticking with that story because she does not want to go back to that life. But I do believe she does suffer some form of, you know, mental illness. I mean, look what the girl had been through. Sure. I can't imagine that she's medicated or you know, seeking mental health treatment. Right. And then part of me thinks, you know, if she wants to be this other person, she's an adult. She's not harming anyone. She's not stealing anyone's identity by doing so. No, she did. Of course, there was perjury. She No, she did in the past. You know, she perjured and she signed false documents. You know, she perjured on these documents. But now moving forward, if she wants to just be Brianna and she's not harming anyone, I say, let her be. Well, yeah, at this point, I think the point was that she had defrauded a lot of people at the time, including social service yes. agencies, by taking money that should have gone to yes. actual children. So I don't think that she had DID. I don't think that she had factitious disorder. I believe mm -hmm. that she was very traumatized and that she really needed to escape this life. I believe that she created identities to become someone else because she had to be someone else in her mind. This relates to questions of the system, though, okay? You know, we often ask, did the criminal justice system get it right? But what about the other system? What about the foster care system and social service agencies? There's a couple points here. First of all, Treva always looked a lot older and had a lot of false claims, mm -hmm. but they didn't seem to follow her. And even when people suspected she was older, they, she seemed to be able to convince them. They would let it go. So is this a mistake or because they wanted to believe her? Mm -hmm. That's one of the questions here. But the other question relates to whether or not the foster care system gets it right, because at 18, Treva's left on her own. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not many 18-year-olds are, I would say now especially, but I wouldn't say are really prepared to be completely on their own without any type of support. It's a scary notion at 18 to be completely on your own. For me, I know that I was extremely independent. I went to college, but I was never completely mm -hmm. on my own. Yes, but legally you are an adult. But yes, I agree that maybe, you know, there should be more support given to someone who's 18 years old, who's coming from a system like that. They need more support. But my biggest issue here is, of course, the, the fraud is an issue. But I'm going back to whether or not her relationship with Ken could be considered statutory rape. And I would assume the police looked into that and they couldn't prove anything. 
That was a great question. I don't know if they looked into it, but she was never charged with any crimes related to Ken. And I thought that was odd. If that was the case now, that wouldn't have happened. Hmm. And if it was a man who was posing- Oh, forget about it. That would have been very different. I think there was sympathy towards Treva, and I think there was Mm -hmm. chivalry in a way that they did not charge her for the crimes relating to a statutory rape of some type. That's quite traumatizing for Ken. He was very, very upset. And I can't imagine what the lifelong trauma was that followed Mm -hmm. him from that. But yes, he was shocked to learn this whole time he thought he was in a high school romance. He was really with an adult woman who took advantage of him. And that's extremely traumatizing. That was his first love, too. And imagine imagine that being Mm -hmm. the jumping board for where you go with relationships. Some people might say age doesn't matter, but it sure does matter if you're under the age of consent and there's an adult woman who you're having sexual relationships with. But again, we don't know what their relationship was like. So I guess we, we know without knowing and without Ken coming forward to press those types of charges, that probably wouldn't go anywhere. Well, I don't believe she suffered from the, the specific disorders that I discussed. I do believe she's victim and offender. She was victim. She was a yes. clear victim. Not only was she a clear victim, a victim who the system did not help and a victim who kind of fell through the cracks. So I think there's a few things to end off here. When she was 18 years old, realizing that she had nowhere to go, I think that there was probably a panic here. In fact, kids who age out of the foster care system have significantly increased odds of homelessness, lack of employment options, lack of education, and substantially increased odds of being convicted of crimes. There weren't any resources for these kids. There are more resources now in the form of what they call extended foster care. And this is to aid children who age out until about 25 years old, which is, you know, to give them some of the resources to help transition them. But in the 1990s, I don't believe these programs existed. And I think that's the right move because we know that the brain is not done maturing and therefore some people have more trouble than others, you know, transitioning to adulthood. It's also hard for someone who's 18 years old to be able to plan out college with absolutely no resources to do so. Yeah, And so Mm -hmm. that's part of the programs. Also, I want to point out that The 1990s brought with it many changes in victim rights and domestic violence resources for those who were abused, as well as more resources for those who were abused in the home, sexually abused. Remember, the victim rights movement didn't happen until the late 1980s and early 1990s. And so it's possible that the resources just weren't there to help children who had been abused who are now adults. Where did they turn to for help? I will say that there, I did a little bit of digging. I just wanted to find out if there were any resources in this regard, and there are now. So the website childwelfare.gov lists several different organizations for adult survivors of abuse in various states. This is a newer development. And of course, victims can always contact the National Sexual Assault Hotline at 1-800-656-4673. I wonder if Treva had known there was help or if she perceived there was help for her. Would this have had a different outcome? I think she was a a case of someone who was really abused, really scared. And I think she saw the only option was to create an identity that was different than herself. Now, do I believe that she's guilty of a crime? Yes, I do. And I, I think at some level she knew what she was doing was wrong. But I also believe that she was victimized. And had she had some of these different opportunities, I don't know this would have turned out the way it did. And as you pointed out, I think one of the most important things that this story illustrates is that relationship between victim and offender. It's not always so clear cut. Absolutely, Amy. Again, a big thank you to Stella L. for suggesting this case. It was super interesting and Hope that we did it some justice. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and we'll catch you next time on Women in Crime. Women in Crime is hosted by Megan Sachs and Amy Schlossberg. Our producer and editor is James Varga. Music composition is by Dessert Media. If you enjoy the show, remember to subscribe and leave a review. You can also support the show through Patreon, where you can get access to additional ad-free content, such as virtual happy hours and an extra a full-length episode each month. For more information, visit patreon.com slash women in crime. So
Sources for today's episode include The Texas Monthly, CrimeLibrary.org, ABCNews.com, and The New York Times.